Welcome to the Saturday morning session of the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2009. Our first speaker, Moray King. I don't believe he's ever missed a conference. <laughs> I cannot remember one he didn't speak at. <laughs> He's uh, an ace mathematician, and he has done way, way more than most mathematicians do because he's actually integrating his math with notes and communications with builders, various kinds of researchers. He's been doing this, well, ever since the beginning in 1984. He's got three books out, which in themselves are credentials. Um, there's the search for zero-point energy and... Uh, there's one, I think it's just called Zero Point Energy. And then there's um, also a third book, and the title just f flew out of my brain. T. Henry Moray. Oh, yeah, Henry Moray, the, the energy machine of T. Henry Moray. Yeah, Tapping the Zero Point Energy, the, the quest for Zero Point Energy, and T. Henry Moray. Really, all three of them excellent books. It's good to have all three of them, really, in your library. Anyway, um, and... Besides all this, he's a uh, great computer programmer, too, and that's how he supports a lot of this. Anyway, let's welcome Moray King. Thank you, Michael. Oh, it's great to be here, isn't it? Let me ask you a question. Prior to coming here, who heard, who heard of Zero Point Energy? Oh, the, yeah, well, it's like preaching to the choir. Uh, how about the, the Browns gas, the electrolyzers and that sort of thing? Who's heard of that? Right. Oh, that's great. That's great. Okay, I'll just tell you, I'll give you two points that I'm about to say on, on the talk that are, that are very important. And uh, w one thing I'm stressing is it is not hydrogen being produced in these devices. In fact, you don't even want hydrogen. You want something better, and I'll be talking about that better thing. And the second thing is to get over unity with these devices, you must condition the electrodes very carefully, and this is not easy to do. And I'll go into some details of, of the people that have been successful. I'd like to thank everyone uh, that's helping with the conference. Isn't this a great venue? Yeah. And, 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 um, the important, probably the most important per people that I would like to thank is you, because it turns out that this community is the community that's going to change the world. Because what I see happening is sharing of information on the web, people doing their research and sharing so others can replicate. We've kind of left the old school behind where an inventor goes, I'm inventing this and I'm going to make a gazillion dollars with it and, 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 and rule the world. That, that's old school. That's dying out now, and a new generation is coming over, and it's from the collective, the collective of all of us, that's going to cause the paradigm-shifting experiments. Now, ever since discovering zero-point energy in the 70s, and then finding out that inventors were stumbling across the right effects to actually activate it and cohere it and tap it in their devices, I, I said that the key to doing this is getting an irrefutable, repeating experiment that's easy enough to do so the hobbyists can do it, garage guys can do it. And, you, and the most important thing about tapping it into a new energy source, you must prove it with a self-running device. Just measurements is not enough to convince a skeptical world. It must be a self-running device. Now, for the first time, uh, each year, I try to pick what I think is the best candidate for that device, the best invention. And it's unprecedented for me to pick the same project three years in a row. And I kind of credit uh, Larry Ohai, who gave his talk in 2005, and I became very intrigued with the anomalies around the Browns gas phenomena. And this got me researching it because I saw anomalies from where I was dis researching, which is the charge clusters and how they were activating the zero-point energy, like the microscopic ball lightning. And I saw the anomalies were the same. And so this convinced me that this class of devices would actually constitute the opportunity for everyone to produce a self-running demonstration that could actually be done, uh, shared on the web, and we would sweep, sweep across the world. Third year in a row, because this project has traction. Tremendous number of interest across the web. There's, thousands, there's many sites, thousands, millions of people actually participating now, uh, sharing information on these various sites, uh, blogs and everything else, sharing technical details. If you go to YouTube and search for HHO, hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, a popular name for the gas, you'll find over 
uh, I think nearly 13,000 hits of people just putting on YouTube, showing off their devices and the progress they're making. And what's wonderful, just like you, they are doing it just to make a better world. I believe in making a better world for ourselves and our children. But not our children's children, because I don't believe children should be having sex. <laughs> I'm from Utah, we're a little bit conservative, and that's why we agree with the astute philosopher Jack Handy. <laughs> Sterling Allen is also from Utah, and he's here at the conference, and we'll be speaking tomorrow, has a wonderful site, Pez Wiki. And after I gave my first presentation in 2006, he made this video that very succinctly summarizes the main points, and uh, we'd like to play it for you now. Now you have to, you have to put it on um, pointer. Keep the mouse on all the time. Just do mouse options. We've got to find a piece of cheese. Mouse options on always. So I need your sound. Hundreds, if not thousands, of hobbyists and independent investigators worldwide are working on various electrolysis-like projects, which put out more energy than was required to run the electrolysis unit. These pursuits go by various names, such as Brown's gas and water fuel cells, and have various heroes, such as the late Stanley Meyer, and more recently John Kansas, who is burning salt water using radio frequencies. A number of commercial interests are involved in the research and development of the various approaches as well. The famous 19th century scientist Michael Faraday defined the limit of output energy possible in any standard electrolysis scenario. It is well known in thermodynamics that it takes more energy to dissociate water into hydrogen and oxygen than can be returned when the hydrogen is burned. But these rogue experimenters of today are reporting output from their setups that exceed Faraday's limit many times over, claiming seven times, ten times, or even more, producing as much as one liter of gas per hour using just a half a watt of electricity. The factors that seem to contribute to these effects include using a large number of stainless plates close together, the plates rough to facilitate releasing the bubbles, driving the cell using square waves, pulsed DC at kilohertz frequencies, and constantly modifying the frequency to optimize gas production. Moray Kink, who has published three seminal books on zero-point energy, recently put forth a scientific model in which he suggests that the excess energy being observed in these unusual electrolysis setups comes from the zero-point energy by producing charged water gas clusters, which somehow achieve a self-organizing criticality that coherently activates and absorbs zero-point energy. The experimental setups are typically rather simple, which is leading to a proliferation of the number of people reproducing and working to improve the effect and its consistency to the point where it can be used to serve as a practical primary energy source, an energy generator that could operate anywhere there is water. Zero-point energy is everywhere in the universe. It is the foundation of the fabric of space. Other groups, such as Exogen Technologies, are using these processes to purify water. These energy sources could actually produce culinary water as a byproduct. The day of water power via zero-point energy is arriving. Welcome to the future. Uh, there's many names for the gas. Uh, Brown's gas, he made it famous because he discovered the anomalies, just a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen from disassociating water. A lot of people believe it's atomic hydrogen and oxygen because that's what Ewell Brown said. He called it HHO. Hydroxy is another popular name. George Weissman probably was one of the first to recognize it's really not, it's really not hydrogen, but he called it electrically expanded water. And here we're going to have the hypothesis of charged water gas clusters. And we're going to see that we're wide open for new names. Uh, the, the apparatus is quite simple, parallel plates. 
Many beautiful commercial uh, offerings are on the web now to get it. There's a big company in Korea that's producing, probably the largest company in the world now producing these units. Uh, Denny Klein, uh, very, the video on Denny Klein very succinctly summarizes the, the, the um, anomalies around Brown's gas. So if you could play that video. Turn the machine on. Denny Klein fires up his hot new invention. His machine emits a flame that feels only slightly warm to the touch. But watch what happens when he touches anything else. Instantaneously, I can burn a hole right down through the center of that brick. The flame instantly turns hotter than the surface of the sun. Heat so intense it takes only seconds to literally burn a hole through charcoal. Three seconds turns a brass ball to glowing liquid metal. Tungsten lights up like a sparkler. Steel, lead, and other metal slices on contact. Yet the tip of the welder stays cool to the touch. No other gas will, will do this. Denny Klein uses an alternative fuel source once thought impossible. He says people still have trouble believing him when he reveals his liquid fuel. Water. Take water and electricity and we break it down through our uh, very unique electrolysis process. Klein has just patented his process of converting H2O to HHO, producing a gas that combines the atomic power of hydrogen with the chemical stability of water. It turns right back to water. You can see the water running off of this. Klein originally designed his water burning engine for cutting metal. He thought his invention would replace volatile acetylene in welding factories. And then one day, as he drove to his laboratory in Clearwater, he thought of another way to burn his HHO gas. On a 100-mile trip, uh, we use about four ounces of water. Klein says his prototype 1994 Ford Escort can travel exclusively on water, though he currently has it rigged to run as a water and gasoline hybrid. Simply uh, speaking, we can change the world by reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. These are equivalent to our... Uh... Pete Dominici is helping Klein take his hydrogen technology patents from a two-room office in Clearwater to consumer markets around the world. You know what? Microsoft came out of nowhere, came out of the garage. Why not hydrogen technologies? The duo is already in negotiations with one U.S. automaker and the U.S. government. Their plans have grown from basic welding with water to powering the entire world from the safest and cleanest fuel on earth. Craig Patrick, Fox News. Members of Congress recently invited Denny Klein to Washington to demonstrate his technology. Now his company is currently... You, you, yeah, keep playing it. Uh, Turn the machine on. Denny Klein fires the 1994 Ford Escort, U.S. automaker and the U.S. government. Now his company is currently developing a Hummer for the U.S. military that can run on both water and gasoline. So far, his water-powered engines have passed all performance safety inspections, so all systems appear to be go right now and gives new meaning to the term running water. You just have to hope that water prices don't go up like... <laughs> okay. Well, nearly everyone believes the energy is from hydrogen. And it's pretty tough to read the web because everyone's believing that. But what I do is I focus on what they actually did as an experiment. The energy is not from hydrogen. And the way I'm going to support this hypothesis is by studying the big anomalies. There's a cool flame, that yet it can vaporize tungsten. It alters radioactivity in, in uh, radioactive substances, even can cause transmutation. Burning hydrogen cannot do that. Uh, furthermore, when they analyze it in the lab and, and look at what the gas is really comprised of, they find very little hydrogen, whether monatomic or diatomic, they find very little. And can we have the lights turned down? And instead they find gaseous charged water clusters. Can we have the lights turned down? Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the, here we're, we're going to present the hypothesis that the source is actually coming from the zero point energy. Because the charged water gas clusters exhibit anomalies very similar to the plasma charge clusters, form of microscopic ball lightning studied by Ken Shoulders, who, who studied them. He, na he named them EV for electron validum, EVO for exotic vacuum objects, because he believed it was coming from the zero point energy. And I found an article on the web that shows how gravity quantum electrodynamics can couple the zero point energy and a collapsing water bubble 
cohere it and activate it and get the energy coupled into the water itself, into the cluster. Then there's a net energy gain. To get a net energy gain, you have to condition the electrodes very carefully. And this is where most people fail. Uh, we need a rough, sharp, pointy type of surface. It appears that a white powdery layer might be necessary. Uh, there's two groups that are getting success. Uh, and there's two hypotheses, so we don't have all the answers yet. And we don't quite know what that white powdery layer is. Uh, a small gap between the electrodes really helps because you can then breach the gap with no electrolyte and not draw much current because we want to go with low current, pulsing voltage. Uh, and then to bet the biggest energy gains, if you do use an explosive emission mixture of water mist, ionized air, and inert gas, this is very interesting, we get to the Stan Myers water injector plug. And I found the patent, the Canadian patent, and I'll have a few slides on that towards the end. So the goal is to minimize the input power, maximize gas production, in order to produce a closed loop system that's self-running. A motor generator like a little Honda generator that provides electricity, you can, you can rectify it on the capacitors, drive your pulse driving circuit, keep the electrolyzer going. If you have a net energy gain, just running this system in a self-running mode is extremely impressive. It would blow everybody's socks off because everybody knows that the uh, internal combustion engine is highly, highly ine inefficient, where you lose half your power generally, half your energy right there. And if you can keep a system like this self-running, you have proven that you have a new energy source. And that's the actual goal, because anything less than a self-running system is not much of a proof. And besides, if an energy source can't even run itself, that's pretty lame, right? It's not going to be a practical device. Here are the featured uh, researchers in this talk. Uh, you recognize some of the names? Yeah. Added a new one here. Chris did a marvelous job yesterday. He's, uh, he, he's kind of rallied the university to do a little uh, basic research to find out what's going on. Uh, special kudos to Patrick Kelly. Uh, he's shared information extensively on the web. I highly recommend his material. Uh, you can freely download it because he writes extremely clearly. He interviews the inventors, he makes wonderful diagrams, and he really communicates clearly. And he's making a real impact in the world because of the way he's sharing information. <laughs> the energy gain is not from hydrogen. Electrolysis cannot yield excess energy. Because from basic thermodynamics, it costs you more energy to break apart the water molecule than you ever get back by burning the hydrogen. Another way of looking at it is the energy state. Water is in a very low energy state. You have to put in energy to get out hydrogen. If you want atomic hydrogen, you have to put more energy in still. And if you want plasma, you have to put more energy in as well. This, this is all an energy loss in this direction. Furthermore, if you wanted to run a car on hydrogen and look at the BTU units at atmospheric pressure where the hydrogen is not compressed, just a little. Uh, it would take about 300 to 500 meters just to have the BTU equivalent of gasoline to run the car normally. So what's the energy source? Well, we, ha we heard from Nassim yesterday, it's the energetic vacuum. Uh, it's the base, uh, fluctuations in the vacuum itself, electromagnetic, it's like microscopic electricity. It's the basis of the uncertainty principle and underlying jitter to everything. It causes pair production where electron-positron pairs can spontaneously appear and disappear right out of the fabric of space. Uh, there's many papers in the standard literature, in the advanced literature, physical review, that uh, sh show that that the zero point energy can be the basis of quantum effects, it can be the basis of the stability of the hydrogen atom, it can be an energy source. Put off's paper on this is very important politically because a lot of people think it violates thermodynamics. This paper proves it does not. You can tap the zero point energy without violating thermodynamics. It can be the basis of gravity, and Heche and Put off's paper. Uh, show it can be the base of, as, of inertia as well. This paper caused a lot of excitement when it came out because it, it really set in principle that in our science, if you could cohere the zero point energy in just a small statistical amount, you could warp the space time matrix and basically undergo extreme acceleration like a hairpin turn without feeling the inertial stress, which means it's the basis of a flying saucer type propulsion. It's in our science. 
The zero point energy can be modeled as a virtual turbulent plasma that's called the quantum foam. Uh, electric flux enters and leaves our three dimensional space through tiny holes at the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters. That's 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the electron. And uh, electric flux enters and leaves, and it creates uh, basically a turbulent, chaotic uh, underlying plasma. This is much better ether theory than the hydrodynamics or the liquid ether theories of the 1800s, because this is a dynamic, energetic plasma ether. So can self-organization be triggered in the quantum foam? This is the question I asked in the 70s. And most professors said, no, it's random, it's chaotic. Everything decays to randomness. That's the law of entropy. But then in 1977, Ilya Prigogine wins the Nobel Prize in chemistry for showing that under certain conditions, self-organization may occur. And these conditions are the system must be nonlinear, far from equilibrium, and have an energy flux through it. And it so happens that the theories of the zero-point energy can fulfill these conditions under certain circumstances. Uh, the zero-point energy is, is modeled, and this is Wheeler's theory of geometric dynamics, as an orthogonal flux from a higher dimensional space. This is the flatland slot that represents our three-dimensional space. As the flux comes through incoherently, we say it's the background, incoherent, background, vacuum fluctuations. If there's a slight tilt to it, there's a component in our plane, in our three-dimensional space, and we say the vacuum is polarized. If there's vorticity in, in the flow, it constitutes an elementary particle. So in this model, the flux of the zero-point energy is like the flow of a river. A whirlpool is, like, is, is maintained by the flow of the river. So the flow of the zero-point energy flux is what maintains every elementary particle, and thus what maintains us. Uh, Robert Laughlin won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, and I highly I, I'm sorry, in physics. I highly recommend his book because it, uh, he shows, he's on the same thesis, that everything arises from collectives, including the laws of physics. It's, it's a wonderful point of view. It's the very point of view that I've been, been presenting, that if you apply that to the vacuum energy, arising from the vacuum itself is everything, as a form of self-organization in collectives. So what are the principles for cohering the zero-point zero energy? We follow Pringagene's principles. We work with a highly nonlinear system like a plasma. We abruptly drive it far from equilibrium, abrupt discharges into the plasma, and we maximize the zero-point energy interaction using ions and vortex forms. It turns out that conduction band electrons, this is normal electricity, though conduction in wires is a very poor activator of zero-point energy because the conduction band is like a smear charge cloud that's essentially in thermodynamic equilibrium with the zero-point fluctuations. However, the vacuum polarization of the nucleus is another story. There are steep lines of convergence onto the nucleus in the zero-point energy, and thus abrupt motion of nuclei can trigger self-organization in the zero-point energy itself. They see it in collider experiments. They call them exotic coherent vacuum states, and quantum electrodynamics arise from the heavy ion collisions. They see it in the plasmas. When you oscillate the ion synchronously, it's called the plasma ion acoustic mode. And it has manifested energy and energetic anomalies and self-organization, like large radiant energy absorption, high frequency spikes, runaway electrons, and anomalous plasma heatings. And what's the nature of, of the organized plasma? It's a vortex ring. When a turbulent plasma gets triggered, it can often form up into a plasmoid, ball, like ball lightning, vortex ring. It has a helical flow around the ring, and it, and it exhibits a natural stability. And this is often modeled for elementary charge arising from the virtual turbulent uh, zero-point fluctuations, the quantum foam. The same analogy applies to plasmas. In the turbulence of a chaotic plasma arises pairs of vortex rings. Ken Shoulders has launched a very, very small one on the order of a micron. Uh, with, with a very small amount of energy on a capacitor. He has to create an abrupt discharge, and it's very important to be very abrupt. He can launch a little EV, he calls it, and he studies it. And he notices whenever they hit a conductor, they make a crater and they exhibit way more energy than it took than he had on the capacitor to begin with. As he studies, study them, they contain about 10 to the 11th electrons, about 10 to the 6 ions. The charge to mass ratio is like the electrons, and they contain excessive energy. And this has been the primary focus of much of my work, is on these charged clusters. Uh, they, have, they exhibit anomalies. They adhere to dielectrics. They like to stick to things. Many can clump into a necklace formation. 
uh, they bore holes in the high melting point material like aluminum oxide. And he says the, the melt is not from heat. It's a disruption of electron bonds that appears like melting. It's a more coherent form of energy that's disrupting the electron bonds. And we'll see how this applies to Brown's gas. He also has experiments that show element transmutation and radioactivity reduction. Uh, he's presented this paper a few years ago showing how under very low energy to make these little EVs, whenever he hits the crater, whenever they examine the crater of the material, they have new isotopes, new elements that weren't in the electrodes, anode or cathode, at the beginning of the experiment. Uh, in the Ukraine, Proton 21 laboratory, which has support from the university, it does big transmutation experiments with a large charge cluster on the order of a kilojoule. It's about a centimeter in size. They hit a very pure target, and they blow the hell out of it, and they get transmutation all over the periodic table, super transmutation. Their work is probably the best transmutation experiments on the web. Uh, there's their uh, link right there. By the way, these slides are on the, on the link at the end of the show. I'll tell you how to get copies of these slides. They're, they're online right now. Uh, George Weissman has done wonderful work researching Brown's gas, and he gives a very good presentation. He's going to talk on transmutation and radioactivity reduction in particular. So Brown's gas is actually a mixture of about six different gases, all created from water, all created on demand as it's going. It's got the monatomic oxygen and hydrogen. It's got the uh, diatomic oxygen and hydrogen. It's got water vapor, and it's got a mixture, uh, uh, something that I call expanded water, where the, where the water didn't actually split, but it gained so much energy that it turned into a gas without actually being steam. Okay, so you have a water vapor which is electrically enhanced instead of steam. And with these six different gases coming out, you get FX that you just can't get with any other gas in the world. This is David Ennis, again, at Southwest Concrete in, in uh, California. And what he's doing is heating up a piece of iron, just a piece of iron rebar, of which he'll add a little bit of aluminum to, uh, that actually makes thermite. And this, uh, this explosion, little, the little pop that you're going to see here, actually uh, is, the, is one of the three procedures that neutralizes radioactive waste. Okay, now he's, he's letting it cool now a little bit. Uh, he was just talking while he did that. There, was, there wasn't any other reason for it. He just wanted to have this pop happen when he, when he was ready to. So now he's just feeding in a little bit of aluminum rod, no flux, and pop, just like that. And radioactive uh, waste goes uh, like a 96% reduction in radioactivity that fast. It also uses, like we're saying, at relatively low cost. So um, the uh, trillions of dollars worth of uh, cleanup that are of uh, radioactive waste that are around in nuclear power plants and spent uh, uh, or outdated uh, nuclear weapons are, uh, can totally be neutralized at the source, right where, right where it sits. It doesn't have to be transported anywhere. Virtually all these places have, they can have iron and aluminum trucked into them and they have electricity already. They can, uh, they can just make the Browns gas right there and neutralize it. What's happening is, uh, uh, that just went on and showed the actual test results and uh, it was a 96% reduction in radioactivity of Americanum. Uh, virtually every radioactive material that's been applied to this gas and I've got documentation on tests that were done in China and in the United States even by the Department of Energy. This particular one was done uh, unofficially by the uh, Atomic Energy Canada via Mark Peringa who was the uh, head of the uh, um, Chalk River Nuclear Reactor which is Atomic Energy Canada's reactor and uh, they have since made a public uh, um, documentation of this stuff that you, you've seen and I've got that sort of literature for anyone who wants to uh, I, I'm selling it for a video and a, and, a, and, a, and a relatively thick packet of information on neutralization of radioactive waste for fifty dollars just a copy of most of the stuff that I've got in any case um, Brown's gas has incredible applications even more than, uh, than you've seen here uh, we're, we're currently starting a business which will go after just one of those applications which is simply uh, non-threatening um, cutting of steel, like if uh, you go into the politics of neutralization of radioactive waste or uh, uh, running vehicles on water or uh, enhancing the medical uh, community uh, uh, techniques, uh, you're going to run up against political uh, um, blockades that, that I don't want to bother with at this particular time.
Uh, the Eagle Research, is, his site is wonderful of sharing of information about Brown's Gas uh, by George Weissman. Uh, the Brown's Gas exhibits a cool flame, about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a famous video. Can you play? This will be a real quick one. It's real quick. If that were a welding torch, you cut off your hand. Okay. Uh, it doesn't boil water. Let me play this one. It's a real quick, real quick clip. Yet it can sublimate tungsten. This is your brown sublimating tungsten. How do you does the tungsten grow? I'm not which we don't think about. I made him look fancy. 2,600. Yeah. Let me zoom in on that one. Let's see what we're right there, OK? Tungsten electrodes, OK? So this is the past of the day, bro. Point, 2, 000, 000, 000, 000. 3, Celsius. And sublimate. Sublimate meaning it turns into what the vapor. Okay. And sublimate on the 5960 degrees. It sublimates at 5960 degrees Celsius. Yeah. And now the sand line without I was adjusted. Uh, no, in the aluminium, the aluminium. 600 grams? Yes. I will apply the tungsten. And you will notice the tungsten will contain sublimate. Please note, do not breathe tungsten vapors. <laughs> Safety tip. On the 6,000 grams. There we go. This summarizes it. See how out of bounds this is? Look, Brown's gas at a mere 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And here's your welding torches toward the bottom. They can't even come close to vaporizing tungsten. The point is, it's not heat that's doing it. We made a, a, the charged water gas cluster, like the, charge cluster, the plasma charge cluster, uh, is coherent to zero point energy. And the phenomena of that cluster causes the electron bonds just to let go. And it appears to be heat that's doing it, but it's something more coherent than heat that's doing it. Here's a summary of the anomalies. It, it adheres to matter. It's electric and polarized. Many people report the bubbles like to stick to things. Uh, there's electric shock when it discharges on its own and, and, and it implodes instead of explodes. There's a cool flame, yet it can sublimate tungsten. Cuts cleanly through pretty much any material. Uh, claims of neutralizing radioactive waste and element transmutation are starting to get more and more confirmed. Uh, Chris Ekman did some wonderful experiments on Brown's gas. And at the university, he found that it was not diatomic hydrogen, not monatomic hydrogen. And it was found as a gaseous water with excess electrons, is what was discovered. And the flame temperature he measured to be 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was published in Extraordinary Science this, this past year. And we saw them yesterday. These guys recognized it's not hydrogen. And since everybody on the web thinks it's hydrogen, why don't we name it after ourselves? SG stands for Sort and Gourley. And then we can run off and claim we invented it and get a patent, and that's what they did. And they say they sneer at Brown's gas because it's a dirty cocktail mixture of including hydrogen and oxygen. And they, when they fuse it in water, they do this experiment on the web that shows, oh, as, as a spire forms up as they freeze it in the freezer. It's kind of pretty. And, they're, and they say, oh, what we discovered is a new isomer of water with the oxygen on one side and all the hydrogen on the other side. And it sounds very much like Riguro Santilli's Magnacule theory. He's down there in Clearwater, Florida, where these guys are at, with Denny Klein. And uh, Riguro helped Denny Klein write a patent, uh, trying to use this as the explanation for what's going on. The scientific community doesn't buy this. And so it's, uh, 
that, that was rejected because uh, this is a little too simplistic. Besides, it doesn't explain where the anomalous energy comes from. But what is well studied and well anomalous in the standard literature is water clusters themselves. Oh, this is a wonderful site, Martin Chaplin's site. Uh, he has a collection of tremendous amount of literature on anomalies on water and, and, and practically everything you want to know about the studies of waters can be referenced off of his website. Probably the best in the world. Uh, there's an MIT site that studies water buckyballs and clusters. And then here I found it on the web. The hydrated electron uh, aggregates between liquid water and steam. It's a gas, it's lighter than air, and it contains an abundance of negatively charged. It's kind of a silly name to call it a hydrated electron because the cluster has, has thousands of molecules participating in the cluster with, with extra electrons. Uh, I believe that's it. Recognize this is the nature of the Brown's gas. This type of cluster is what uh, is seen in the literature, and I, th I think this might be it. How a water bubble could, could actually activate the zero point and cohere zero point energy comes from a, uh, a theory of qua cavity quantum electrodynamics. And basically, I can summarize the idea with the Casimir plates, which uh, basically they say forms a standing wave, and the modes, there are more modes outside, and it tends to push the plates together. But what's interesting, bubble cavity. Uh, quantum electrodynamics, it's the, it's the dynamical motion, an abrupt collapse of the bubble, that's the activator and create, creates that standing wave inside the bubble. And as you keep collapsing the, the, the bubble, the standing wave shifts frequency. Uh, it becomes higher and higher frequency. Provenslick has a paper on the web that shows in this model he can explain steam electricity, waterfall ionization, thundercloud charge separation, and sound luminescence all from one model. And if he's right, that means the dynamics of what's going on on a microscopic collapsing bubble activating zero point energy in the thundercloud means that the zero point energy itself is actually the source of lightning. Uh, this is a diagram from his paper showing the hydronium and hydroxyl ions. And basically, the zero point energy is activated when the bubble wall collapses, creating a continuously increasing resonant frequency that acts like an ultraviolet to X-ray laser, which coincides with the disassociation frequency of the water molecule bonds and can flip the water into a new state. He explains sonoluminescence, which is the bluish glow that you see from ultrasonic excitation of water, especially if you add some inert gas like argon. Keep that in mind when we get to Stan Myers. Uh, the shock wave of the bubble collapse causes the cavity quantum electrodynamics residence, which couples to the zero point energy, creates excimers. These are the plasma like molecules in an excited state. And when they decay, they emit the bluish photon. Did I skip one? Yeah. Uh, there's a series of, there's different types of water fuel po projects. Probably the most important, the most popular is the boosters because they improve gas mileage and people have to go out there and, and put them on the car. It's much more difficult to make a car run completely on water. It's actually very tough. And to make a pure self-running system, you want to make a closed loop system where you disconnect the battery and prove that you have a new energy source. There's an interesting history on these electrolyzers and running cars on water. Uh, it goes back to Garrett, 1935 in Texas. There were newspaper reports of him uh, running a car on water. And his patent is readily available in the archives using a parallel plate electrolyzer. William Rhodes is probably credited with the modern multi-plate electrolyzers. He just believed he was getting hydrogen and oxygen. It wasn't that special to him. Uh, Yul Brown really recognized it was special. And he recognized the big anomalies. And I guess it's justifiably named after him because he recognized there's something very, very special about this gas. Bob Boyce was started in the 80s with this, uh, building his electrolyzers. And because of suppression problems, he decided he's going to completely share his information and, deta and details on the web so others can replicate. Uh, and he's probably making a very, very big impact because Patrick Kelly helped write up his work. Uh, he's using 70 plates, about 33 millimeter gaps. He was using some potassium high hydroxide electrolyte. Uh, he championed the idea of sealing each plate individually so the water couldn't flow between the two chambers. And a lot of people call that the dry cell. It's kind of a silly name. It should be the separate cell. Because when you use electrolyte, the current can go around 
the plates. And thus, when he has the plates, he can only has, needs to charge the end plates and then the equal potential of, of the floating plates that aren't charged and just naturally form up their different voltages and all the, all the, cell, all the plates get activated that way by polarization. Very popular way to do it. Uh, a lot of people are having trouble with the magnetic fields in the plates. He says, hey, just make the magnetic alignment the same in the plates. So that's what he does, a little current, a little small coil. Gets the magnetic fields all aligned. And he says, when you put them in the electrolyzer, just keep, keep the magnetic fields aligned. Uh, ten videos just appeared on the web this year feature, featuring Bob Boyce telling a story, uh, sharing details, and he's really trying to change the world. Uh, Stanley Myers is probably most famous for the publicity around him uh, making, uh, running a car on water. From this website, he has a documentary. It runs on water, narrate, narrated by Arthur Clarke. And here's a small clip from the video, about a one-minute clip. Let's uh, play it off the web. I couldn't find a better one. This, uh, this one. Uh, his later work, though, he felt he was getting much better with the water fuel injector plug. Uh, and he, he abandoned the, the electrolyzers for this, which, is, which he felt was far superior to getting it. And there's support for this idea uh, in, in, in the literature and experiments that are done. For example, Peter Grineau out of MIT did abrupt water discharge, explosive discharge, um, uh, ex water explosions in liquid. And it had to be very abrupt with a large car and he would dump a capacitor back. And he would show he had an energy anomaly excess energy, a force anomaly excess force. Furthermore, he could photograph a plasmoid in the chamber of the, of the barrel of, of his water exp explosion. But probably the record setter, Ken Shoulders claims, for the amount of energy that he puts in, if he starts with a vortex of water and shoots one of his EVs through the vortex, he says you get a tremendous force force effect coming out the other end, a tremendous energetic pulse that pretty well damages anything that it hits. He couldn't find a way to practically absorb the energy. The analogy is it's like shooting a, win a bullet at a, at a windmill blade. There's just a severe impedance mismatch. But he was sharing this, he says, he believes for the amount of input energy, he's getting the most output energy. I'm going to play this again. I played this last year because this video got yanked from the web. And it's a from the Extraordinary Science news clip. And uh, it, it features the water fuel injector. By the way, if you see something good on the web, grab it. Because good stuff tends a to... A car that runs on water instead of gasoline. Can it be true? Well, inventor Stanley Meyer made an announcement today in Colorado Springs. He says he's come up with a device that will hook up to any engine and allow it to run on good old H2O. News 13's Kurt Goff tonight on the possible impact of the water fuel cell. Stanley Meyer says the answer to dependence on foreign oil lies all around us. In seawater, tap water, and rainwater. Any kind of H2O, he says, can power just about every type of engine. How? With the water fuel cell. It fits in the palm of his hand, but it could revolutionize the world. You're talking about a pollution-free, totally new source of energy, the voltage disassociation of water. The fuel cell converts water into a gas, hydrogen oxygen, which is released in the form of thermo-explosive energy. So the water fuel injector simply replaces the spark plug. We hook it to a hydrogen computer system, which regulates and meters the flow going into the injector. It processes the water in such a way to release its thermo-explosive energy. The man who invented an engine that can run on water says he's been offered a billion dollars in cash by oil producing countries to sell his patent. So far, he hasn't sold. Environmental specialist Jan Porter talked to the inventor who thinks that the U.S. auto industry could produce cars that run on water now if they wanted to. Our industrial base of the world is based on the utilization of Stan Meyer has a car that runs on water. And that's drawing crowds okay. at this year's Extraordinary Science Conference in Colorado Springs. Myers has developed what is called the water fuel cell injector. The injector breaks down the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen is what powers the car. Basically all we do is replace uh, the spark plug and replace it with the water fuel cell injectors you see right here. Mm -hmm. We simply feed ordinary non-processed water, or processed water in here, and as the water goes into the injector, uh, it hits a very high pulse voltage frequency, which instantly converts it into thermal explosive energy. And as a result, we can run this car down a road on water. 
Meyer's invention was introduced in Britain earlier this month, and now the Brits have followed him here. We recently took a scientific delegation to witness Stan's work, to really evaluate it, and came back saying, this is one of the most important inventions of the century. Yeah. Uh, Stan Myers was murdered. It happened in the spring of 1998. He was poisoned at a restaurant celebrating with two Belgium investors the funding that they were going to put up to make a factory to make those water fuel injectors so cars could be retrofitted. There's an audio tape of interviews of dozens of witnesses, but the audio tapes of the two Belgians are mysteriously missing. You can read, uh, there's a link to the uh, investigative reporter's report as he investigated the Stan Myers murder. However, his twin brother, identical twin by the way, Stephen Myers was the electronic genius behind Stan work, Stan's work. He was an electrical engineer. He's still alive. Uh, he's kind of reclusive, doesn't want to really participate publicly. And um, he has, there's a patent that came out in 2005 of, of his work. The water injector plug was, uh, I found it on the web in a Canadian patent. Notice the year, in May 1998, they put the next filing year in Canada. You get a chance to hold off publicizing the patent until the very end. And then you have, you have seven years, I believe, and then you have to publicize. It happened after his death. And interestingly enough, the first time I ever heard that Myers was working with rare gas. Remember somnoluminescence? Seems like when you mix that in an explosive mixture, it seems to help, maybe help considerably. I uh, mixed water, ionized air, and rare gas, just enough in the plug per, per pulse of driving the cylinder, per uh, in the fuel injector. So he's only working with little tiny bits at a time to drive, like, like a spark plug, to drive the cylinder. Uh, here's a side view of the, of the device. Uh, on the, here's the nozzle of the device. On the outer ring, we see is the inert gas is on the outer ring. The middle ring is ionized air, and the water feeds on the inner ring. He is ex his excite the circuit he used to excite it was the same circuit he used in the electrolyzer. Uh, uh, he felt that that waveform that you see at the top was very important to, to excite and disassociate the water in his model. And here's a Bach diagram from a patent of essentially used uh, on the bottom he used ionized gas from a laser to ionize the air as he was feeding into the system. So the system is a lot more complicated than portrayed in the video. Exogen is very interesting. They were very successful in Canada. Exogen Power later became Exogen Technologies. I believe they had suppression problems. They had to stop making their power claims. The lead inventor there was Stephen Barry Chambers. He's an interesting guy because his sister is Marilyn Chambers, and she happened to be the wife of Stan Myers. And after Stan dies, she takes off fi with Barry, fi finds Exogen. And I featured this patent last year because all three patents that he wrote are the same, the same, uh, and the same pictures and the same text. The only thing changed were the claims. But he was very successful. He had, uh, in his parallel plate device, had about 40 stainless steel plates and millimeter spacing. He explored the spectrum very methodically, like an engineer from ex exciting it from 10 to 250 kilohertz. A so 90% duty cycle was found the best. But the most important fact was he could run at low power, only uh, 0.3 amps at 12 volts. He would produce enough gas per minute to run a one kilowatt Honda generator. And this really turned me on because it's the very thing I want everybody to do. Run the generator, make itself running. Uh, Paul Zagoras is new. He he uh, entered very late. He's one of the newest inventors. Very successful because he actually was not alone. He had a big engineering team that he hired. That he's in a business, and his electrolyzers. Uh, on the way, he used to participate in the blogs, and he got very quiet after a while. After he made a car, he made a car running on water. Uh, got a whopping three miles per gallon in the city and six on the highway, but of water. And his business was the boat. He didn't care about wasting water because he was making, his focus was on racing boats. And he figures he'll just scoop it out the front and dump it out the back. So he was auctioning eBay, on eBay auctioning electrolyzer circuits. And then they had to stop, and there's a suppression story. 
on the web. And his old company was Zagoras Racing, which he sold. And his new company now is Zagoras Engineering. And guess what? I got to talk to him. I had a couple phone call conversations. He said the suppression was a bit exaggerated. What he said was the Attorney General's office from Washington called his attorney. He said, you've got to stop claiming that, these, uh, that, th that you're running cars on water because people will, will short the oil stocks and the economy will crash. Well, the good news, the economy's already crashed now. So let's go for it. <laughs> kind of set a record on the spacing, uh, under, under 0.6 millimeters. He says that's kind of tough. If the water's dirty, it, it'll gum up the plates. Uh, he used uh, sandblasting, very different than everybody else, to roughen up the plates. And he says it was kind of very important. He got, he got equipment. He was using silicon carbide at 40 to 45 grit to, to blast it. 45 degree angle was very important, he said, as, as he puts the plates through. Uh, working with the standard 316 stainless steel plates. And he was done. He cleaned it with ammonia. So he did not go through a lengthy conditioning process that everybody else had to go through. He was very successful making a very, very rough surface. And he got a lot of gas for the amount of current he's putting in. Go ahead and play. He put in more current, but he sure got a lot of gas. This is silent, so don't. I think he has a record setter for the conversion process. Okay, next. So, so his device had uh, standard stainless steel, the sandblasting, about 32 plates, tight distance. Uh, he felt he has a, a proprietary type of waveform to really optimize it. And from what I could read on the blogs, he didn't want to talk about it, was that he's around uh, 40 kilohertz, and he wobbles the frequency. He doesn't just hold it at one frequency. Uh, he, and, I, and the idea is you just keep tuning it to, to maximize gas production, because the system's constantly changing, and something so mechanically dynamic is producing all these bubbles. And he just keeps tuning it for optimal gas production. Very clever. So he had an advanced circuit. And he worked with some very good people, chemists, electrical engineers, and technicians at his company. So he was really able to do, to do a lot. Uh, the idea on the feed is you feed water in, and out comes gas on the other side. And you just do it on demand as your engine needs it. Uh, there's been great replications on the web with people sharing. Dave Lawton really kicked it off. He's a good engineer. He's from Harnwell Labs, retired from Harnwell Labs. That's the equivalent like our Lawrence Livermore in our country and in, in England. He replicated the Stan Myers electrolyzers. Uh, he shows he gets a lot of bubbles just like Stan, same thing at a half, of a half an amp. He's sharing exactly what he did with the stainless steel and what he made. The circuits, the circuits are out there in Patrick Kelly's where occurs the original circuit of the, the, the Myers using, using a generator. He simplified it. Uh, just driving it with square waves. Uh, he noticed that he does better if he inserts a little coil in between, a bifolar coil to produce spikes, because on the trailing edge of a square wave, he can output a spike. And then he discovered something very interesting. When he connected uh, an output, just an output line to the cells themselves and rectified the pulses that were coming off the cell, he would discover a cold current effect. Now, uh, people that study the, the free energy machines and things, especially about Moray and other free energy machines, to launch, to uh, conduct a brishable power on thin wires without heating the wires is the cold current effect. It's like the energy propagates around the wires. He started to study that, getting electricity directly off the cells from, from this phenomena. And this, is, this takes us up to his latest work. I don't know how much he's sharing on this. He's sharing a little bit. Uh, I think this offers the opportunity of going straight into electricity and not taking it through an internal combustion engine where we lose half our power. So we have an opportunity. These are ideas which I think are very fruitful to go straight to electricity because after all, when Brown's gas implodes, it, gives, it puts off a spike, an, an electric shock. If you can rectify that shock, right, you can get the power back. And if indeed it's tapping the energy and cohering to zero point energy, you'll get more, a bigger spike out than what you put in to drive it. 
much more efficient than taking it into an engine. So this is very exciting. Uh, Ravi Raju was replicating Dave Lawton, and he struggled like most of the people out on the web struggle. They get their plates, they hook it up, as the instructions say, and they get nothing. This is the most frustrating experience. It's the experience of the majority of, of, of the investigators. And when they get nothing, they'll take some electrolyte, doesn't matter what you throw in there, make the water conductive. Then you'll get some current, and then you'll get some bubbles when they're happy. But they missed the point. The point is, you want to minimize your current. You want to just go, that's why we have the small gaps. Uh, he was working in, in tap water, and then he said, Dave, I'm not getting anything. And after contacting Dave Lawton, apparently he was watching a suppression story on Robbie Raju. As a result, he was motivated to share all his information on the, on the web on, on his experience and how to condition the electrodes. Notice there's this rust that comes off of it. It's like iron oxide as you're conditioning them. Uh, he says, when they're properly conditioned, you get this white powdery surface. We're not sure what it is. He thinks it's chromium oxide, but it's the wrong color. The chromium and nickel oxides tend to be black. Let's play the video. He says, don't touch it, because when you touch it, I'll show you what happens. This is very short and silent. So one of the mysteries is, what's that whitish substance? Uh, we actually don't know. That's an action item for our community. Let's find out this year and analyze what the substance is. Uh, we, uh, he thought it was an oxide. They felt it was very important to have it on the conditioned plates. Now, this is a very different than Zagoras. Zagoras just made them nice and rough. They didn't get anything until this whitish powdery. And so Dave Lawton shared the details with Ravi how to condition the electrodes to build up this layer. And it took a month. That's a big surprise. But you work at low current for these cycles, and then you gradually increase the current, but you run very short. And he says the, at low current, you make tiny grains of this whitish substance. And then at high current, you make the bigger grains. And it's kind of like envision growing like a stalactite. You're like growing a little cone microscopically on the surface. And that helps make, make the rough surface. So, uh, but I said, uh-oh, hobbyists typically won't have the patience to you know, work a month just to get it, and you know, very few. So can we do a little better? Well, uh, Robbie did really well. I'm not going to play this, because it's just bubbles at a half an amp, just like Myers got. Um, and so the, but the details were shared on how to condition it. Uh, this is from, I think, from Bob Boyce's work. This is what he did. He says he can do it in three days. If he uses a little bit of electrolyte, potassium hydroxide, and he worked in distilled water. Now, Ravi Raju worked with tap water in, in, in India. Tap water in India, please, that is not a controlled experiment. <laughs> the only thing you know for sure about that water is that you shouldn't drink it. <laughs> uh, but Bob Boyce did better. He says, let's work with the still water. I'll tell you exactly how much potassium hydroxide to get enough conductivity to go. And then this is what you do to condition it. Now, he only took three days. And then you clean it up. And then if you have a tight spacing in your electrolyzer, then you can work without the, electro without the electrolyte at all. So, and so, or at least a minimum amount to get just to get the effect. So we're trying to work at low current. So what's the details going on on the surface, the emitting surface? It's well known that in the Brown's gas devices that when the plates are separated, we get hydrogen on one side and oxygen on one side. And the bubbles in the middle, that's it. That's our charged water gas cluster bubbles are there. That's what you want. In fact, in the SG device, in their patent, they wanted to separate the spacing so they could just grab the bubbles out of the middle. And they weren't interested in over unity. So when you have the electrodes far apart, you have to add electrolyte to get enough current to start producing the device. And then, and, then they did, and then they avoided the hydrogen and oxygen, which they didn't want. Uh, however, when the, when the spacing is very tight, uh, the atoms, the oxygen atoms, tend to, tend to combine with whatever they collide with on first collision. And if the spacing's tight, they'll collide and enter into the cluster itself and help build the cluster. 
So we gotta, we're, we're changing it. So that's another way of getting the pure gas, the pure Brown's gas out, as opposed to hydrogen and oxygen. Now, if we look microscopically, what a sharp surface would look like if the plates are close together. Imagine that's just a millimeter across between the plates. And then if you're growing a rough surface, like a con conical sharp point structure, it would be like pr producing sparks if you were in low pressure in air. Right? It would, that's how close you are to creating the discharge. That's the type of surface you want. Uh, same with launching EVs, the little plasma charge clusters. You want a sharp pointed surface. Ken Shoulders used liquid, liquid metal to replenish the tip to keep the tip sharp because guess what? We actually blow off the tip each time. Uh, Mesots, who, who analyzed the charge clusters as well in Russia, uh, showed the details of what happens when the charge cluster is launched. Around the sharp point, there's a blow up of the sharp point. There's glow plasma and a liquid, small liquid melt that produces a protuberance into the plasma. And then we blow the tip off of it. And notice on the abrupt blowing of the tip, the circulation that occurs is a vortex ring. And we kind of launch the vortex ring straight up, right off the tip on the explosive emission. So could something similar be happening microscopically in these electrolyzers producing the Brown's gas? Perhaps. It's just a hypothesis using the analogy that the charged water gas clusters are very similar to the plasma charge clusters. We don't know because these are details that have not been studied at all. And we have to study this microscopically. So it's just a hypothesis. Another interesting uh, paper came up talking about the importance that the possibility of a thin oxide layer that's uh, an insulator, dielectric, if it's very thin, just a few atoms thick, can produce some very interesting physics. Because there's a huge electrical field, even at a small potential, that occurs because the, 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 the insulator is so thin. And you can get electron tunneling. You can get proton acceleration. And this is Horace Hefner's paper. Uh, as well as some very interesting physics on what happens if you break down the dielectric. Uh, you get semiconductor diode behavior, a polarization stress, microdielectric breakdown, abrupt discharge events, fractal emission. That's like when uh, the earth ball lightning coming out of the earthquake cracks, called fractal emission, happening microscopically. Uh, it's well studied. It's just an anomalous glow that comes out when a crystal cracks, uh, which can produce EVO formation, which is the, the earthquake lights microscopically. That's Ken Shoulders EVs. And, the, and likewise, when you're in water, the charge cluster formation. So notice we have two hypotheses regarding the surface. We have just rough and pointy, and we also have a thin dielectric layer and breakdown. We don't know which is relevant. Probably both uh, are relevant to the effect. So, uh, so we have two working hypotheses on what's going on microscopically on the conditioned surface. If it's all you want is rough, Hey, last year was suggested by some engineers here at the conference in the brainstorming that why not work with centered stainless steel? It's already a mesh, and you can get it in any size mesh you want, one to 140 microns. It's kind of expensive, but for an electrode study, you could just work with it to see which pairs of electrodes make the most bubbles. You drive them the same, and you work with different pairs, like centered at a low, low mesh or centered at a higher mesh. You run it against the potassium hydroxide condition or the sand blasting condi condition, and just make run a contest and see who wins. This, this electro study has not been done, but there's big payoffs for doing it because that'll help everybody be successful if we can zero in on the easiest thing to make, to roughen up the plates and be successful. Well, you want to see electrode competition between properly conditioned versus poorly conditioned plates. Uh, our winner is uh, the Zagoras electrodes by one of the earlier customers. Walter McNichols bought one. He was studying. And he's just going to drive it at DC. I'll just play this one. Uh, this is going to be my uh, first experiment with the Paul Zagora cell. Sitting in two inches of uh, tap water. Uh, I'm going to turn the switch on. Uh, is on and you can see the tremendous amount of uh, hydrogen and the bubbles that are coming off of it. It's just uh, phenomenal. Um, how much time do I have? You got about four or five minutes left. Four or five. Okay, okay go to the next slide. 
Oh, I do that. Uh, are losers mythbusters? <laughs> have you guys seen the video? Yeah, they're. Um, because I have so little time left, I got to wrap up. We want some qu time for questions. It's, it's a four-minute video, so let's not play it. Uh-oh. I get the time back. Play it. OK. Who went your slide this time? <laughs> I've also gotten plans for a homemade fuel cell that you can build that converts water into hydrogen gas that you can use to run your car. Grant's hydrogen fuel cell is all about electrolysis. When you apply a voltage to electrodes in water, the H2O molecules split into hydrogen and oxygen. This internet patent can allegedly generate so much hydrogen that you can run a car with it. Adam's going to build the electrolysis device as detailed in the internet plans. That right there is the business end of the end of the oil monopoly, man! <laughs> While Grant is concentrating on the power, it's the current through the electrodes that should cause hydrogen to be released. This should be a square away, and right now it's kind of a nasty saw too. After an hour of fernickety fiddling, Adam's fuel cell is connected to Grant's power circuit, and everything's ready for a test. Dude, I see bubbles. Check it out. Yeah, <laughs> it is a It's working. Hydrogen is uh, bursting forth. But will these tiny bubbles be enough to fuel a car? Now, this is the YouTube uh, author's electrolyzer. He's showing he can do better. Kind of okay. Not nearly as good as, as our others. To test whether a car could even run on hydrogen in the first place, the boys are going to hose some directly into the carburetor. Ready? Yeah, okay, right. here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I guess you could, if you had a lot of hydrogen, run your engine completely without any other modifications. Let's do it again. <laughs> you know there's going to be trouble when it's all going so well. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a little bit test. With a rather nasty backfire, it's time to back out. I think it's best if we just let it go. Yeah, we're done. Well, we'll summarize what we learned. Uh, the pulsing electrolyzers uh, make the charged water glass clusters. And in a support for the hy hypothesis is uh, large anomalies that are very similar to the plasma charge clusters. The energy is not from hydrogen, despite what everybody thinks on the web. And they all think that it's all making hydrogen. They're wondering why the, why the uh, their their um, boosters are doing so well because what what's happening on the web is they're saying look the boosters are doing great I'm measuring it and my miles per gallon increasing and then all the skeptics go nonsense it's fraud it's fraud you can't be doing it you're lo you're losing more energy and it, because they all think it's hydrogen 
the, the, the guy, the skeptics win because hydrogen can't do it. But the charged water gas clusters containing anomalous energy from the zero point energy vacuum all of a sudden uh, stick to the water and uh, stick to the gasoline, uh, enhance the burn of the gasoline, and are really contributing significantly to improve the amounts per gallon. And that's why the experiment, as they do the experiments, they win. They're, they're showing they're doing it. But they can't explain it because as soon as they say hydrogen, it's easy to prove that hydrogen can't do the job. They're doing, so they're talking past each other on the web. And it's kind of fun to read. And the explanation is you're not making hydrogen. You're making something much, much better. And it's from the zero point, en zero point energy. We saw how the zero point energy can actually couple in microscopic bubbles uh, via qu cavity quantum electrodynamics. Uh, the, the best electrolyzer is the simplest. We're working with a rough, pointy surface of stainless steel plates, clean and conditioned. Now, this is, we still have an action item here. We don't know which it is. Just rough and pointy, I prefer that because that's easier. But if we have to build up um, a, a layer of this whitish substance, we need to find out what it is, then so be it. We need to get that information out, discover what the substance is, and um, share that on the web. By working with a small gap, we can, we can uh, not have to use electrolytes, so we can work with small current. And then electric voltage spikes produce some interesting effects, including some of the cold current effects. And what Zagoras found is that by altering the frequency and wobbling the frequency, he could do better uh, driving the gas to optimize its gas output to build this. Make the closed loop system. If you can make this just idle and run itself, it's extremely impressive because everyone knows the uh, losses in the internal combustion engine, and that this would, this would change the world. If p other people could do this, if this could be done by students so they could show their professors, this would do the job. So that's the goal, to change the world, create the self-running system, simplify it, post the information on the web, and as a group, we'll create a thundering herd that will sweep the world and make a, and make a better energy source. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, one more. Oh, one more. One more. One more. Uh, my, my obligatory commercial. The books are up in the bookstore. And now we can have questions. And by the way, all these slides are available right now on the web from the Pez Wiki site, uh, the same site that has the, the video. At the, so you can get a copy of the slides right now. And all the links are hot links in the slides. So you can go out and, and see the web. So you guys are up now. We, we have enough time to take about one or two questions. If there are two questions, if they're short. Just a quick comment. I think when those bubbles form and they collapse, you got cavitation. And that's